Okay, um, welcome back to our mini-series on um, what is essentially special relativity now. We're going to be talking about a, a, a visual and, 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 and function representations of length contraction and time dilation. So if you direct your attention here, uh, what we have here is known as the Lorentz factor. And this is something that we factor in to many classical equations to turn them into relative equations. So when you have your p equals mv, you'll find that the Lorentz factor, or something very similar, is visible as simply a multiplicative term around the classical p equals mv equation. So you'll find that the relativistic, or the relative momentum um, value, is you know, simply uh, this expression here, multiplied by uh, mv. So your momentum will just be mv over here. That is what relative uh, momentum is equal to. Uh, the same thing extends for uh, kinetic energy. There's relativistic time, there's relativistic uh, momentum, there's relativistic uh, length, uh, and they all have in common the Lorentz factor. The Lorentz factor um, happens or becomes an important factor when you're changing frames of reference. Before, you'd have simple geometry, um, classical vectors, Newtonian laws, um, and, and, and these kinds of frames of reference were less so about relativity and more so about um, relative velocity as a pure uh, uh, geometric representation where you could draw arrowheads, you know, to the tip to tail um, of another vector and the relative vector is equal to an additional subtraction of individual vectors regardless of a frame of reference. These shifts or these frame transforma transformations are known as Galilean transformations. In, in, in relativity, when you introduce relativity and you begin using the scope of modern physics over classical physics, you find that these transformations present inaccuracies and you're forced to use what's known as a Lorentz transformation. Now, the Lorentz factor is simply a factor that's involved in relativistic equations um, and it's applied to easily recognizable classical equations. So every classical equation can have the Lorentz factor put in, um, you know, multiplicatively around the entire classical equation. If you put the classical equation in brackets and multiplied it by the Lorentz factor, you'd find that if you want to keep it as a, as, as a classical equation and you have a low enough velocity, this will reduce to 1. And so the relativistic expression um, of many equations relating to energy, mass, time, space, motion, the relativistic equation reduces to the classical equation. Um, in, in many cases, because what our x value here represents is velocity. And this is, this expression here, within the larger expression, is equal to 0 because many of our velocities are so minuscule compared to the, squ uh, the, s the speed of light squared. So you simply don't reach points where this holds a significant enough value in, in, in everyday macroscopic examples. What you do find is that as you equate this part of the expression to zero, you'll also expand that to say, okay, one minus zero is one, and the square root of one is one. <laughs> shooting this. Uh, the square root of 1 is 1 and 1 over 1 is 1. So the Lorentz factor equals 1 at very low velocities because you're saying comparative to the speed of light th the velocities you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis essentially approach 0 in comparison. Now so what is the red and what is the purple? This is the important point of the video. So the red is the Lorentz factor as a proportion of dilated time compared to proper time. Now what is this purple then? So if we're saying that this version of the Lorentz factor, you know, is the proportion of dilated time when compared to proper time, the inverse of that is simply this square root expression over one, which is the square root expression. So this is the inverse of the proportion of dilated time to proper time. What does the purple mean? Well, believe it or not, the purple is actually the expression for the proportion of contracted length compared to proper length. 
they are inversions of each other. So, what you find is, there's somewhat of a symmetry when you look at dilated time and contracted length. Now, there's nowhere near perfect symmetry, especially as you reach increasing velocities, but to the naked eye, you would assume that these two values here are equal distances from the green line, and I'll explain what the green line is in a second. However, you, f you do find that the symmetry disappears, because whereas the purple goes from 1, a height of 1, to a height of 0, delta y on the purple is 1, whereas the red actually approaches infinity. So delta y for the red is infinity. So you find that, you know, there's nothing symmetrical about 1 versus infinity, is there? So you find that the changes and discrepancies between these two, the red and the purple, are smaller as you approach uh, velocities that are equal to zero. So that brings us to the meaning of the green line. The meaning of the green line is the, is, is, is the uh, classical model of, of all time, all space, and all velocity. That is to say, there's no relativity that is ever to be factored into any calculation or any observation, which means that the green line represents the red and the blue lines married to each other. Time and space do not separate. There's no, there's no distinction between contraction and dilation. They remain unified. This is oftentimes an oversimplification. However, you see at these low velocities, it basically, it's essentially the truth. These red, blue, or these red, purple, and green lines are so close together that they might as well equal each other. And as we zoom in even further at lower, lower velocities, remember this y-axis line at x equals zero is our zero velocity, we find that the dominant feature of the entire graph is just the green line here. So what we're finding is at these incredibly small values, you know, there's no contraction or dilation at these very large values. Contraction and dilation are, are immensely different. Okay, so what about the bounds or the extremities of this? Look, uh, even though there's not much symmetry on the y-axis because, you know, these blue and red functions aren't necessarily equal distance from the green line at all times, um, you know, so the symmetry between them begins to disappear as you increase in velocity. What about symmetry on the x-axis? Well, it is pretty symmetrical on the x-axis. They're both what you call even functions. At our x equals 1 line, uh, this represents, in fact, the speed of light. Why does the speed of light equal 1 and not 3 times 10 to the 8? Um, we're basically saying that velocities here are to be expressed as a proportion or as a ratio between the velocity and the speed of light. So the speed of light is 1, because 1 is to 1 when you put the speed of light over the speed of light. So the velocities on the graph are proportions over the speed of light. So when we have v equals 1, or x equals 1, we have the speed of light. What happens at the speed of light? So we found that our length contracts to a position that's approaching 0. There's, a, there's an intersection here at x equals 1, our speed of light part of the graph, and y equals 0 which is the bound, or the, the positive bound, of our uh, length contraction part of the graph. So we do find that, theoretically, if you're traveling at the speed of light, if that were possible, time would approach infinity, as you see here, and length would contract to the point where it's pretty much not measurable, imperceptible, and it's approaching zero. Length contracts and time dilates. So what we have here is just a graphical representation. If I were to say, okay, I only want to see relative to proper time and proper length, the proportions by which my relative time or my dilated time and my relative length or contracted length, uh, the proportions by which they change. These are changes in time and these are changes in length. Okay, and they represent a relationship between contraction and proper length and the dilation and properness of time and so this is a little graphical representation of that where we have a completely completely negligible presence of relativity classical physics is our green line we have our dilated time as our red line uh, our blue line is contracted length and our black line is the speed of light
And so this is a little visualization to help you see what happens. So I hope this clarifies and I wish you luck in understanding what is to come in the next few pages on the website. Uh, see you again shortly.